And you know, that's a little bit old, that chart. That chart's a couple of months old. And if you uh, want to really see something that said, take a look at what happened. Oh. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest mini-sode from Theater and Stream. My name is Chuck. And right up front, I just want to make it, you know, clear, you know, if my intro didn't kind of already give it away. I'm about to break one of our, like, cardinal golden rules of this show, which, you know, is to, by all means necessary, leave culture war bullshit to the side, especially, you know, avoid, you know, diving too deeply, you know, into politics. Um, well, we have a lot of reasons for that, namely just that all of this is supposed to be an escape for us from all the wackiness and craziness of the world that we live in. And, you know, the, the reality, you know, that a lot of what goes on in this world is meant to, you know, like divide us and, you know, discourage us from engaging with things because of what it goes into call it political correctness call it you know you know the the innate you know virtues or vices you know that are perceived to be within a piece of art and that you know generally gets in the way of you know us being able to live and experience you know fully but as is quite evident the the last news cycle has been pretty fucking relentless um it's kind of hard to ignore a lot of what is going on in the world right now, especially when so much of what is happening in current events either seems to like mirror you know, a lot of the like shows or movies that I've been into over the years, you know, cause there's, I'm really into political thrillers. I really like a good political drama. And of course, if people are working within those realms, they have to think about, well, what could happen? And that often leads to things kind of, you know, informing each other between the fictional and the real. And in the last year, I guess within 2024 itself, you know, it's an election year. There's a lot of gonzo shit going on and there is just too many things occurring that make me go, Oh shit, I've been prepared for this, thanks to Hollywood. You know, first and foremost, um, you know, we're going to be digging into a couple different things where either the, you know, creator of the work, you know, you know, has been reacting themselves, which, you know, has, you know, made my initial reactions to things feel a little more valid and germane. And the other, you know, is one from just this last year uh, that, you know, is you know, I think kind of looking ahead to where things could go awfully wrong. And I want to kind of reevaluate, you know, the, that particular work since we did make it a featured review on this show, you know, just a few months ago, but right off the bat, you know, we're going to be going about 20 years into the past or more, probably like, like 25, technically, we're going to be looking into the seminal political drama from Aaron Sorkin called the West wing. And then we'll wrap it all up by going, you know, just a few months ago into what Alex Garland's civil war has to say about our current predicament. The West wing itself is a, a show that is near and dear to my heart. You know, it's it, for those who haven't seen it, you know, it's very much inspired by the people who were surrounding uh, the bill Clinton administration people who are still relevant in politics today, the speech writers, you know, the chiefs of staff, the other you know, political bureaucrats that surrounded the, you know, that particular president and every president that has followed. And what's interesting about Aaron Sorkin's show is that it came at a time, you know, where it really was hitting its popularity during the Bush administration, which caused a great deal of grief for your, you know, average, you know, liberal at the, at the time, uh, Democratic voters were deeply in despair, you know, what with what that administration was, you know, doing. 
and you know just like the cultural shift you know that was occurring with it being in power and for a lot of those people you know especially my family members who are you know skew you know leftward i come from a very divided family in that way which is kind of unique for north dakota which tends to be pretty homogenous politically like we haven't had a you know a, a proper you know democrat you know you know, run for office and win you know and stick around in some time and you know the one part of my family deeply disdainful of you know the bush administration the other side of my family i had cousins get name dropped at the rnc in 2004 because they were either you know in the marines or in the navy you know during the iraq war and that was a very scary time for our family because you know we just didn't know how they were all going to make you know if they were going to make it out okay and barbara bush was very kind to my aunt cindy and that's something that we never really let go of and this show you know, it was kind of the backdrop of that. We were getting it on Netflix. We were watching it and it was very much a kind of like an, an idealized view of what politics could be. It's very Pollyanna ish people win in like the drama of each episode by making the best points, making the best arguments, you know, and often the, the right word leaning characters are made to either look buffoons or get put in their place at least once every episode as soon as our heroes are able to do that um but the reason why i'm bringing it up is because a lot of the plot lines from that the early seasons of that show when sorkin was still in control have definitely become quite relevant given current events uh namely it's the entire plot line devoted to the cover-up of Josiah Bartlett, the president's uh, multiple sclerosis diagnosis. This was a uh, secret that was known only to, I think, like the physician, um, the chief of staff, and the, the first lady, who herself was an actual physician, not a fake doctor like Jill Biden, you know, who's an educator with a PhD. And that plot line you know, is the backdrop, you know, you know, for, for like the first three to four seasons of the show, it's really, really important because, you know, not only, you know, is the cover up a problem, but how the president reacts to finally having to give up the ghost and come clean to the American people is a, it's, it's one of the key moments of the show towards the end of season two, the cover up kind of finally becomes unwound he basically has no choice but to tell everyone what's going on and you know it becomes the focal point of his impending you know your re-election does he decide to run given the fact that at any moment his illness could accelerate and you know put him you know out of commission and in incapacitate him and instead of like really you know, like, you know, taking the, that step to be like, well, maybe I shouldn't be president. Instead, he, you know, Bartlett recommits himself. He makes it clear that he's not going anywhere. He is going to run. And not only that, he is going to win. And it, uh, you know, and eventually, you know, it comes to a point where there's a very critical uh, presidential debate where he has to, not only own it, but dunk on the the dumb Republican who is, you know, has really no chance of winning as long as Bartlett doesn't, you know, fuck up. And of course, he sticks the landing. Bartlett wins the election, and like it resoundingly so. He even wins the Dakotas, you know, which is you know something that Ron Silver's character, who's this Republican consultant, who's just brought on to you know, do the dirty work and help, you know, get them over the line. That's something he's patting himself on the back for <laughs> during the, the post election euphoria, you know, as he's, you know, you know picking up a, a girl at the, the election night after party. What's interesting to me anyway, you know, coming from, you know, all of this is, you know, how it, you know, informs what's been going on with our own president. 
Um, it's been quite evident, you know, to anyone with eyes, you know, who really, you know, wasn't willing to, you know, just say that the emperor had clothes when he didn't, that Joe Biden had some mental deficiencies. Even his most ardent supporters kind of had to come around and admit that when he failed to do what Bartlett did at that debate, you know, you know, in June and, you know, he fumbled the ball, he dropped the bag. And now we were in a reality for a brief moment where he was fighting for his political life. The people around him were, you know, kind of finally being put in the spotlight for obscuring the truth from the American people. And not only from the American people, we have since found out they were obscuring the truth, even from Biden himself about not only his electability, but, you know, also of his own ability to do the job day to day. Like this was a president who wasn't having cabinet meetings for nine months with the full cabinet. And even when like some small brokered meetings were happening, it was being delivered to him, you know, piecemeal in scripted ways. He would know who to call on and he would know what they were going to say. The summaries were all prepared. And unlike, you know, Bartlett, um, you know, Sorkin's character, I mean, un unlike, yeah, unlike, you know, which was Sorkin's character, um, you know, Biden really wasn't willing to do the right thing for the American people at that time. And like uh, Sorkin himself penned an article, like an essay, basically, where he was reflecting on the work he had done in the West Wing and how it applied to what he thought President Joe Biden should do in the real world. And, you know, he invokes the, the end of the second season, the episode Two Cathedrals, which is, you know, very, very important. It's when he finally kind of, you know, like, you know, it's, it's really in question what's going to happen. And then, of course, in the third season opener, he says, I'm going to win. I'm going to stay in it. And all of his people have to fall in place and support him in that effort because they believe in him. We didn't really see that in the real world. The people around Biden, I don't think, really believed in him. They believed in themselves to do what they had done for the last three and a half years and just stage manage his presidency in such a way that everything that, you know, party line administratively wanted to get done could get done. And, and I think that's the, you know, the key difference. Bartlett is an idealized TV president whose admission of his infirmities was actually taken, you know, as a, a sign of strength. Like this was integrity that this man had. And, you know, Sorkin really was, not seeing that in Biden himself and went as far as to say that, oh, the Democrats should just nominate Mitt Romney, the most uh, palatable you know, Republican that exists for the Democrats in this air in, you know, in this day and age, you know, from the state of Utah, who, you know, which is Republican truly in just they have sworn their allegiance to it. But they honestly, I think that's a red state that could easily go purple versus you know texas or florida or any of those other ones that every, you know every democrat is ever hopeful will go from purple to blue someday um but of course that's kind of laughable you know like the idea that you know democrats would forego their array of genuinely quality you know you know, leaders and you know in you know in governor houses and you know like within you know, like, you know, like the Senate or whoever it might be, there were other people who were good options. And the idea that Romney was the way to go was just kind of silly. But, you know, the, the, there's a, a portion of this essay that I find very interesting. Uh, Sorkin says, uh, part of the wish fulfillments of the West Wing was that oratory could be persuasive. Barack Obama could come forth at the Democratic convention next month in Chicago and remind us once again that we're not red states and blue states, but the United States. And full floridedly endorses old rival Mr. Romney. You know, it's 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 just cuckoo bananas, and it just kind of shows you how silly and forgive the term shit lib Sorkin's thinking is. But that's the thinking that informed the whole thrust of that show, but it is to the latter years of the West Wing's credit that they seemingly predicted the rise of a political operator, much like Barack Obama, 
you know, in the, the, I think it's a Santos, the character played by Jimmy Smits, who eventually goes on to, through a brokered convention, become the democratic nominee and win the presidency. And that all aired in like 2007, the final year of the show's run. Literally hours after Sorkin's you know, essay went live, we of course found out that Joe Biden was deciding to drop out. And that kind of just threw everything out the window. Everything coalesced around his vice president, you know, Kamala Harris, however you say her name. My wife is always giving me shit because I seemingly cannot do it right. So if I, if I have said it wrong, forgive me. I don't know if it's Kamala, 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 you know, vice president Harris. And, you know, and what precipitated that? Well, it was another thing that the West Wing also kind of explored, which is the failure of the Secret Service to prevent an assassination attempt, which, you know, of course, was the season one finale of the West Wing, where some, you know, white nationalists somehow were able to get access to a vacant building outside of a venue that he was speaking at while he's doing a, a glad handing, you know, you know, you know, line of people he's shaking hands with everybody and they just take fire on him using handguns and a lot of people get shot rant you know like uh you know josh god i can't think of his, his name now but uh the, the the you know josh gets shot the secret service man winds up getting killed a little bit later you know at a gas station during a robbery in a freak accident so you know cj craig loses a love interest which is you know a bummer but the the show itself doesn't spend a lot of time delving into what went wrong and why that assassination attempt was nearly successful. Because, of course, the president is shot. Uh, Bartlett does go to the hospital. And that is like one of the first times where someone outside of the, the circle of conspiracy around Bartlett is informed of the truth. The doctor operating on him needs to know. And his wife tells him and is just like, no one else knows this. You need to know it. Do with it what you will. You know, you know, do the right thing. You know, like I'm sure HIPAA is involved somehow. But the, the long and the, the, the short of it is there, there's kind of a nexus of these events that we have been currently living in that were important to the show and its plot lines. And, of, you know, of course, the, the, the event that incited, you know, Joe Biden to really reevaluate his position was the unsuccessful assassination attempt just like a week prior to his announcement um, in Butler, Pennsylvania, where former President Donald Trump, you know, is grazed by a bullet, um, a bystander is, you know, killed. And we are currently watching, you know, live on C-SPAN, the very real investigation and accounting into how this was able to occur. And I'm not bringing any of the, anything up to be conspiracy minded. There's no tinfoil on my head right now. That's not my purpose here today. The, the whole point in bringing it up is that the West Wing yet again gave us some insight into how things can fail, how things can go wrong, and how all of these people who we entrust our nation to can fuck up and fail just like regular human beings do. No one is perfect. And the consequences can, of course, be massive because the imagine, if you will, that Donald Trump had died that day. It would have left this nation broken, uh, almost irrevocably, I would argue. Because you have that, like, like a lot of people call it a cult of personality, but like you have that populism of support around Trump, you know, which has made him able to subsume the Republican party almost completely to where any point of resistance to him is just can't get any traction from within. They are beholden to him. They don't really have a say in the matter as a political party in the same way as the, the Democrats do. They have a firm handle on being able to secure the, the 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 leadership that they want in a way because they aren't beholden to populism left-wing populism died with bernie sanders in 2016 and then its last gasp was in 2020 
when everyone got out of Biden's way except for him, leaving him alone, flailing with no other choice but to throw his weight behind him as well. And but that just, you know, it begs the question, where would we be if that man had died that day? Where would the Republican Party be? Where would his voters be? How would they handle the lack of accountability from people like the Secret Service director, you know, from you know, the former Secret Service director, Cheadle, from the Homeland Security director, Mayorkas, and ultimately from the Biden administration themselves? And I don't think it would have been good. We, have, we, we came within millimeters of civil war. I, I, I really do feel that which has you know, made me reflect even further on the other you know, topic of discussion here today, you know, being you know, Alex Garland's film, Civil War. I just want to you know, break a little bit to you know, go back on some of the, the, the criticisms I had for Civil War at the time, um, because it got a lot of credit from you know certain critics for being apolitical in its approach and you know not trying to take sides but just looking at a scenario and then having it play out and i found that whole interpretation to be very disingenuous because you know whether garland intended for it or intended to or not civil war definitely has a point of view it definitely has a perspective and it was definitely looking at someone very specific and how it constructed you know the the most awful idea of an imperial presidency that we could have where a, a president is unwilling to give up power and doesn't walk away after two terms does what washington wouldn't do you know, you know, you know, does like, like what we haven't done as a country since we changed the rules when, you know, FDR died, you know, like FDR was the closest thing we've had to a king in our nation's history. That guy wouldn't walk away from power, you know, until, you know, God came down and took it away from him, which is what Biden said it would take for him to walk away. And you know, you, you can make your arguments for why it was just fine for FDR to stick around as long as he did. That was a very special time in American history, American history, world history. But are, are, are we there now? Are we in a position where we can only rely on one Caesar to stick around forever? And the general feeling is no. Well, we don't want that. We as Americans don't want to have an, an imperial presidency in that sense. We don't want a Putin. We don't want a, 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 a Xi Ping, like in China, where that guy just seemingly never goes away. Look at what's happening in Venezuela right now, where you have the despot in charge of that country just actively rejiggering the election results away from the expectations and towards a resounding victory for himself. These are you know, the, the, this is where democracy dies, and that is a, a very real fear for a lot of Americans right now, rightly or wrongly, and that is the imagination that creates a movie like Civil War. There was a lot of missed opportunities in Civil War, in my opinion. The 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 implications of its you know trailer rollout especially with Jesse Plemons' character. I, I think they just call him, like, sunglasses. I forget what they call him, but he's the, the character who's, you know, throwing bodies into a mass grave and asking people what kind of a, an American you are. And they chalk it up to, oh, well, he's just a xenophobe. He's just killing people who aren't from one of the 50, one of the 50 states. You know, if you're from Hong Kong, you're a goner. If it kind of seems like you've come from over the border. This guy's going to kill you. And I found that very cheap because the, in a proper civil war in a conflict such as that, where there are certain groups who feel that they truly believe and are fighting for what represents the true America. 
if you're from the wrong state, then you would wind up in that mass grave and not just, Oh, you're from Missouri. Well then you're fine. That's, I didn't really buy that. And it, it didn't quite hit home for me in the way that I hoped it would because the, the reality that we almost experienced was just that where militias in all these different States would align themselves. The States themselves would align themselves and there would be a great deal of inner conflict within this nation over its destiny. And it didn't seem too interested in trying to explain exactly how we wound up there, you know, beyond some of the actions of the presidency, you know, like uh, dismantling the FBI, giving himself an extra term, killing journalists in DC, you know, like the, those are all things that people assume, you know, would be the, the worst you know, you know, case scenario should Trump get reelected. And when you have such a Republican looking president as they do in civil war, it, it's very clear who they're pointing at. And I didn't buy into the idea that it wasn't political enough and that it didn't paint things, you know, appropriately. I, I felt like it was very clear in what its messaging was and people were, you know, just being obtuse or just wanting him to be even more explicit. And, you know, Garland still made a, a pretty decent movie. It had some, you know, thrilling sequences in it. But when you get down to the end and you have, you know, a black female soldier putting a bullet in the dude's head after he has begged to, to not be killed, th that is wish fulfillment for a lot of people. Some of my own family members expressed to me in 2020 that, you know, Trump was putting them in a position where they felt they had no choice but to get a gun and put a bullet in his head. And, you know, I, you know, just, you know, you know, told them lovingly, it's like, I really hope it doesn't come to that. And I hope that you don't make that choice because we all like to act like we are Americans. We settle things at the battle box as Joe Biden called it. But this movie is a reminder of how easily we can slip past those values and directly into something very scary. And instead of being taken as a, like a, a call to live up to our values, to avoid a situation such as that, a lot of people looked at that and felt, yeah, this is the world we live in. And I know what side I'm going to be on. And I know what I'm going to do. And I was very disheartened by that. And I, I think more people should have been, but you, you can't always get what you want. And we live in scary times and all we can hope, you know, through, you know, having amity with our fellow Americans, no matter who they vote for, no matter what they believe in, you know, is, and I, maybe I'm the Pollyanna now I'm even more Pollyanna ish than Sorkin because it's like, we are in a, in a post persuasion period. And if you can't change people's minds, you know, like you, all you can do is hope to change their hearts. Cause the, the last thing I think any of us should want is to go from the ideals that exemplified a show like the West wing and wind up in a reality that could be even more, terrifying than what was conjured up by Alex Garland in civil war. And th that kind of, you know, does it for me. I'm stepping off my soapbox. We're going to be avoiding politics is if at all possible going forward as per usual. But when you have political art intersecting with political reality, one can't help, but just look at the parallels and the synchronicity that exists within it. I don't call it predictive programming. All one can do in the realm of imagination is consider what could happen, good or bad, and how will people handle it? And I don't relish at all, you know, the, the circumstances that we are in. But all I can do is just ask anybody watching this, if you've made it here to the end, is to just not hop onto the comment section and turn this into a, a political mudslinging. 
because that's not what I intended this video to be. There's too much at stake. And more than anything, it's our ability to just be at peace and enjoy our lives away from our screens, in front of them, wherever it may be, and to not have them just be a distraction, but to have them be a reflection of you know, where we are and who we are. So thank you very much for watching. We'll be, you know, reconvening at our usual time, you know, on the, let me pull up my calendar here. So I'm just not, yeah, on the fifth, we are going to be reviewing. I have to remind myself because my life is a little nuts, but we're going to be uh, reviewing Cuckoo uh, from director and writer Tillman Singer starring Hunter Schaefer. It's looks very, very interesting. Like this is, you know, prime time for really transgressive and bizarre, you know, horror thrillers this year. 2024 has been replete with them. And hopefully this is a good entry in that and a good distraction from all the insufferable political ads that I constantly have to remind Google ads not to show me. And yet they seem very committed to putting in front of my face anyway. Thank you very much and have a good week.